order. I can now announce the outcome of the divisions on motions relating to the United Kingdom's withdrawal from and future relationship with the European Union. In respect of Mr Clark's motion C, Customs Union, the ayes were 273, the noes were 276. So the noes have it. In respect of Mr Nicholas Bowles's motion D, Common Market 2.0, the ayes were 261, the noes were 282. So the noes have it. In respect to Mr Peter Kyle's motion E, confirmatory public vote, the ayes were 280, the noes were 292. So the noes have it. In respect of Joanna Cherry's motion G, Parliamentary supremacy, the eyes were 191, the nose were 292. So the nose have it. The lists showing how honourable members voted will be published in the usual way on the Commons Vote app and website and in Hansard. But, uh, uh, points of order. Yes, the Secretary of State. Point of order, Secretary of State, Mr. Stephen Barclay. On a point of order, Mr. Speaker, this is now the second time the House has considered a wide variety of options for a way forward. It has once again failed to find a clear majority for any of the options. And yet the result of the House's decision on Friday not to endorse the withdrawal agreement means that the default legal position is that the UK will leave the EU in just 11 days' time. To secure any further extension, the Government will have to put forward a credible proposition to the EU as to what we will do with that extra time. This House has continuously rejected leaving without a deal, just as it has rejected not leaving at all. Therefore, the only option is to find a way through which allows the UK to leave with a deal. The Government continues to believe that the best course of action is to do so as soon as possible. If the House were to agree a deal this week, it may still be possible to avoid holding European parliamentary elections. Mr Speaker, Cabinet will meet in the morning to consider the results of tonight's vote and how we should proceed. Thank you, Secretary of State. Point of order, the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Jeremy Corbyn. On a point of order, it's disappointing that no solution has won a majority this evening. But I remind the House that the Prime Minister's unacceptable deal has been overwhelmingly rejected three times. The margin of defeat for one of the options tonight was very narrow indeed, and the Prime Minister's deal has been rejected by very large majorities on three occasions. If it's good enough for the Prime Minister to have three chances at her deal, then I suggest that possibly the House should have a chance to consider again the, op- the options that we had before us today in a debate on Wednesday so that the House can succeed where the Prime Minister has failed in presenting a credible economic relationship with Europe for the future that prevents us crashing out with no deal. Thank you to the Leader. Yes, a point of order, Mr Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It would indeed be an outrage if the Government sought to bring back its deal. It really is about time that the Government accepted reality, that the deal that the Government put forward has been defeated three times, with the largest defeat in parliamentary history. Now, Mr Speaker, no, no, the Right Honourable Gentleman is entitled to be heard and believe me, notwithstanding, notwithstanding the shouting from a sedentary position, he will be heard. That's the be-all and end-all of it. It's as simple as that. The Right Honourable Gentleman will be heard. Mr Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I acknowledge that I'm disappointed that tonight that we haven't won with revoke, with having a, a people's vote and a single market customs union, but the reality, Mr Speaker, is that these votes on two occasions have won by a very small number. 
and we need to try and see where we can find consensus and work together. But fundamentally from us that represent seats in Scotland, we voted to remain in the European yeah, Union. Yeah, and tonight, yeah, Mr Speaker, a vast majority of Scottish MPs have voted to revoke Article 50. Yeah. Yeah. A vast majority of Scottish MPs have voted for a people's vote. A vast majority of Scottish MPs have voted to stay in the single market and customs union. It is crystal clear to us from Scotland that our votes in this House are disrespected. And it's becoming increasingly clear to the people of Scotland that if we want to secure our future as a European nation, then we're going to have to take our own responsibilities. And Mr Speaker, the case is this. Sovereignty rests with the people of Scotland, not with this House. The day is coming where we will determine our own future, and it will be as an independent country. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll take a point of order from Mr Nicholas Bowles. Oh, on a point of order, Mr Speaker, I have given everything to an attempt to find a compromise that can take this country out of the European Union while maintaining our economic strength and our political cohesion. I accept I have failed. I have failed chiefly because my party refuses to compromise. I regret, therefore, to announce that I can no longer sit for this party. Oh, Nick. Nick, don't go. Come on. Honourable gentleman who's told the House. Indeed. Of course, I shall come to other honourable members. A point of order, Sir Vince Cable. No, Mr. Speaker, it is even clearer than it was the last time we had indicative votes that there is one compromise option that has very substantial support. There is the largest number of votes in the House for a people's vote, larger than last time. Uh, is it not possible to combine the two and therefore find a way forward through a consensus? Well, the right honourable gentleman's question is, of course, of a rhetorical character. It invites no response from me, but he's registered his view, upon which I'm sure colleagues will reflect. Uh, point, of order, point of order, Mr Nigel Dodds. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, and isn't it the case, just to remind the House, that the only proposition that has ever had a majority in this House is the Brady Amendment? That is a fact. Whatever members may think, whatever they may say, that is the proposition that has had a majority in this House and could allow the withdrawal agreement to go through. And as uh, Chancellor Merkel visits the Irish Prime Minister this Thursday, can I say that there is still an opportunity, Mr Speaker, for the Prime Minister and the Government to prosecute the issue which has bedeviled her withdrawal agreement throughout the backstop. And that issue still needs to be addressed. And if it is addressed, then we can be in business. Uh, point of order, Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Just looking at these figures, I'd like to reinforce the comments from the Right Honourable Member for Twickenham. I, I regret the, what, what the Honourable Member for, for, for Grantham and Statham has had to do, but if you were to link to his proposal the opportunity to have a public vote, we would have a yeah. huge majority yeah. in this yeah. House. Yeah. And the idea... The idea that we would avoid doing that for fear of the democratic moment of the European elections is frankly absurd. Why would we be afraid of one democratic uh, event and for fear of that avoid a further one? That makes no sense. The Prime Minister's deal is dead. We should look at where the majorities in this House lie. They lie with a softer Brexit going against a people's vote to the country. Thank you. Uh, point of order the Father of the House, Mr Kenneth Clark. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I've, I've, with, the, with the help of the people who work with me, I've got a damn sight nearer a majority in this House than anybody else has so far, uh, from the uh, rather curious and now historic Malt House uh, compromise, which I fear is dead. Uh, but but uh, just, just three is quite near. We, we cannot go on with everybody voting against every proposition. And the difficulty is there were people who want a people's vote who wouldn't vote for my motion because they thought they were going to get a people's vote. Uh, there were people, the Scottish nationalists, who wanted common market too, so wouldn't vote for mine because they wanted common market too. 
all of them actually have nothing against mine. <coughs> if they continue to do that, they will fail. To the Honourable Lady, I would say, if you add the people's vote to a motion like mine, you lose votes all over the place and in the Labour Party. And you lose more than you gain. They should actually accept that they haven't got a majority yet for the people's vote and vote for something which they have no objection at all to as a fallback position. But uh, that, Mr. Speaker, is politics. And I sometimes think that this particular parliament that I find myself sitting in is not very political at the moment, and it is confounding the general public. Thank you. A point of order, Anna Subri. Mr Speaker, what you don't know is that there was an effort made a week ago yes. to put forward composite yes. motions. Yes. And unfortunately, um, that, and unfortunately, despite the efforts of a number of us, that was resisted. However, as the Father of the House rightly identifies, there is undoubtedly, and that's why it's a three-stage process, a way of getting this together. The Honourable Gentleman would let me just explain. The reason why, as the, as the Father of the House knows, many of us couldn't support the Customs Union was because it didn't have the regulatory alignment, which I must say, the Labour Party, who unfortunately didn't get round to tabling anything today. But if we put the Customs Union, regulatory alignment and a people's vote, no, and a people's vote no. together, the, the Honourable Member could then vote against it. But if you look at the figures, and if I could have the Honourable Gentleman not yelling in my ear, there is every chance on Wednesday we can find a compromise. And Mr Speaker, the other thing that needs yes, but it needs to be said. I am very upset, as I'm sure many others are, at the Honourable Member for Stamford and Grantham, who is a fine champion for his community, to making the decision that he has made. But he's wrong, because he has been right to do what he's tried to achieve. And the reason his motion failed was because it didn't have the longevity of being in the withdrawal agreement. And on that basis, again, a compromise does exist that can get a majority. Thank you. Point of order, Dr Julian Lewis. Um, on a point of order, Mr Speaker, can I, within the rules of order, just point out that a clear majority of Conservative MPs, no fewer than 159, including tellers, voted a week ago that we should leave the European Union without a deal. So I find it very strange that everybody assumes that because of the House's position as a whole that this cannot be a way forward, because if it was always going to be left to the House of Commons, dominated as it is by Remainers, to have the final say, there was never any hope for a referendum to achieve anything whatsoever. Uh, well, uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman has made his own point in his own inimitable way, and he gives every indication of being well satisfied with his prodigious efforts this evening. Uh, uh, point of order, Mr Hilary Benn. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The consequence of tonight's votes is that the House has voted in favour of nothing, and as a result, in 11 days' time, the United Kingdom will leave the European Union without an agreement unless the Prime Minister, who has just left the Chamber, acts. One of the things we have now voted three times to tell the Prime Minister is that we will not accept leaving the European Union without an agreement. The last time by 400 votes. Listen to 160. The Prime Minister indicated a week ago that she would respect the will of the House, and I was going to ask on a point of order, Mr Speaker, whether the Prime Minister had given you any indication she intends to make a statement from that dispatch box to the effect that she will now be writing to the European Council to seek a further extension to Article 50. 
short answer to the right honourable gentleman is that she has given me no such indication, and I have received no such indication from any other minister. Indeed, we have just had the results of the votes. I have announced them only a matter of minutes ago, and there has been no communication to me from government ministers. But if that were to change, I would, of course, notify the House, or it would become apparent to the House ere long. Point of order, Vicky Ford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On a point of order, it's probably worth recalling that last Friday the withdrawal agreement, as negotiated by our Prime Minister, achieved more votes than any of the options yeah. we voted on. Yeah. Yeah. It requires no response, and, but I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady. And point of order, Mr Peter Kyle. Yeah. 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 I think that now is the time for a little reflection and humility. I would have expected a little more humility from the Brexit Secretary in his statement, because when it comes to the need for a majority, we are all in this together, and that includes government too. The bottom line is, from the last two sessions of these indicative votes, the proposition that myself and the member for Sedgefield have offered has come top, and tonight came within eight votes of his own proposition, the proposition put forward by government. Is now not the case? If there is not a majority for anything outright, Mr Speaker, we have to start looking to see how minorities in this House can be brought together in order to get the blockage that is within the House of Commons sorted so that we can move forward as our politics can move forward the Commons can move forward and our country can get the resolution it needs. Mr Speaker, can you help guide us how government can start acting with humility, reaching out and working with those of us with propositions rather than sticking to its guns? Well, the Honourable General, I fear he invests me with powers I don't claim to possess. It's late at night. I think we have to await, as uh, Macmillan used to say, events and see what transpires tomorrow. And uh, God willing, I shall be in my place, and I will always seek to facilitate the House, which is the responsibility of the Speaker to do. But I can't say with any confidence what will happen, and in that respect, I think I'm frankly not in a minority. I think most colleagues would say with confidence that they don't know what is to follow. Point of order, Sir William Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I thought, in the light of the words blockage, uh, that was just used, and, and the suggestion that somehow or other there is something wrong with our democratic system. Could I just simply say this, may, may I, as a point of order, uh, just to recall the fact that Section 1 of the Withdrawal Act 2018 quite clearly states as a matter of law that the European Communities Act 1972 is repealed on exit day, and if that exit day happens to be April the 12th, so be it. That is the law of the land. That is something which we ought to hang on to, because that is the anchor of the referendum for which the British people voted. Honourable gentleman, he's represented his own position correctly, yeah, yeah. and I know that because I've heard the honourable gentleman make that point with comparable eloquence on several occasions. Yeah. Whether he has entirely fairly characterised the position of the honourable gentleman, the member for Hove, I don't know. But the honourable gentleman, member for Hove, will doubtless study the official report and make his own assessment. A point of order, Mrs. Ellen Goodman. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This is obviously a very disappointing evening for all of us. I, unlike some of the other people who have made points of order, I am not going to promote the merits, great though they are, of the motion put forward by the Father of the House. But I just do want to point out that uh, the Government has an opportunity tomorrow to bring something forward to resolve this. The House has another day on Wednesday, and we might consider how we best use that, perhaps by looking at uh, some different way of uh, addressing these problems. We've got the time booked, so although this is desperate and last minute, this is not the end. Uh, thank you. I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady. Point of order, Sir Peter Bottomley. Mr Speaker, this point of order may involve you. The most popular, the, the, the motion which had the greatest number of votes was E on the confirmatory public vote. Although that, as my honourable friend has pointed out, was fewer than the number of votes for the Prime Minister's 
deal on Friday, can I invite you to consider whether you would get party leaders together to see whether those two could be put as a runoff with a free vote across the House? I always reflect on points that colleagues make to me, but I'm not anticipating what might happen in days to come. The Honourable Gentleman has made his own point in his own way. I didn't mean it in any unkind or discourteous sense, but it's a point I've heard floated in parts of the popular prints in recent days, but that doesn't invest it with a validity which it might otherwise lack. Point of order, Mr Gareth Snell. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I, I profess myself upset that the father of the House's motion came within three votes, particularly given that five members of my own party who professed to want us off the Brexit <laughs> voted against it and could have made a decision of impact on tonight's decision. However, Mr Speaker, what I would ask of you is, given as the point my friend from Bishop Auckland has made, we are having this again on Wednesday, are you able to give us any early indications of what procedure on Wednesday will look like when motions can start to be tabled and whether there will be a new way of looking at this in order to see if we can come to some conclusive outcome? I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman. The only early indication that I can give him is that I think it is reasonable on the basis of what was passed earlier today in the business of a House motion to suppose that the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Member for West Dorset, will be carefully contemplating the intended procedure for Wednesday. Specifically, I think it is reasonable to expect that he will be looking to table a business of the House motion, and from that the Honourable Gentleman will gather what the Right Honourable Member West Dorset has in mind. Colleagues will be able to take a view about that. Moreover, just as colleagues have spoken to each other in recent days, bidding for support for particular options, it is open to colleagues to communicate with each other about these matters before Wednesday, and I rather imagine that they will do so. Precisely what procedure is envisaged, I can't say, nor is it self-evidence that there can be only one procedure proposed. There may well be a number of alternative ideas circulating in colleagues' minds, and I can't say more than that. We will have to see. Well, there's nothing very significant about that. A sort of knowing grunt from somebody on the Treasury bench as though something remarkably significant or suspicious has been said, but neither of those things is so. Point of order, Mr. Graham Jones. Mr. Speaker, to follow on for, uh, from my honourable friend's comments from Stoke uh, Central about the influence that you may have on the business of the House motion, if any, uh, on Wednesday, given the fact that we need, we need now to be brutal about this. We need to look. The Prime Minister's deal was last defeated by 58. That's the worst option, so that gets taken off the table. Are we going to have an eliminatory process? Custom market, uh, customs, um, common market two tw lost by 21. The uh, people's vote lost, confirmatory ballot lost by 12. The revocation by 11. And clearly, top of the table was uh, the father of the House motion on the customs union. Are we going to have a brutal process, and can you influence that where we get to one outcome? on Wednesday because it needs to happen. I would say to the Honourable Gentleman, I don't cavil at his point, and I don't want him to think I'm being pedantic, but I dislike the use of the word brutal. I'm not in favour of brutality. I am in favour of clarity, of decisiveness, of resolution. And insofar well, he doesn't need to apologise. Insofar as that requires some concentrated thinking, oh, I agree with that. Look, some colleagues will be pleased with the outcome of tonight's yeah, yeah. vote. Yeah. Uh, the Honourable Gentleman yeah. Member for Shipley is noisily yelling his approval of that observation, beaming as he stands by me. Other colleagues are disappointed. We are where we are. Nothing has won tonight. Uh, what do, in what do I take comfort? Well, uh, Roger Federer put on a majestic yes. uh, masterclass in Miami last night, so I'm happy about that. And of course I'm happy that although nothing won tonight, and here in this chamber and at the Emirates Arsenal did win 2-0. So, you know, I just have to content myself with that for tonight. Uh, I appreciate that Newcastle members won't be so pleased and we shall have to see what happens tomorrow. I'm sorry that I can't add, but I feel that colleagues have ventilated their points and it's right that they should do so. And I do think we can advance matters further this evening. So what I suggest is that we look to getting a decent night's rest and recharge our batteries and try to do our duty with resolution but good humour tomorrow.